So you guys are in the home stretch, we're almost there. Uh, we're gonna move on to the adult upper extremity radiographs. And you're gonna find that uh, same objectives, we're gonna talk about a systematic way to do it, ABCs, ABCs, ABCs. We're gonna talk about some of the common fractures and dislocations and some of the common pitfalls. So again, starting with anatomy, because I always think it's a good, uh, good thing to brush up on. Starting with the hand, just like in the foot, we have proximal, middle, and distal phalanges in the fingers. In the thumb, it's a little bit different. We just have a distal and proximal uh, phalange. You have your metacarpals. Um, in terms of joints in the fingers, you have a proximal interphalangeal joint, a PIP, and a distal interphalangeal joint, or a DIP. In the thumb, you only have an interphalangeal joint, or an IP. In terms of um, naming digits, most hand surgeons vastly prefer that you name them and not number them. So thumb, index, middle, ring, and little or small finger. And the reason why that is is because it eliminates all the ambiguity. Because is this the first finger or the second digit? Like it gets confusing. So most hand surgeons really actually prefer you to name the digits. Um, there's your metacarpal phalangeal joints. Coming down into the wrist, my residents love when I pimp them on the carpal bones. Uh, I like to put them on the spot. Um, there are a couple of mnemonics out there that uh, are taught in school. The one that I like is so long to pinky, here comes the thumb. And I like it because it makes anatomic sense. It's also politically correct. Um, and in terms of the carpal bones, there's the scaphoid, the lunate. Uh, the triquetrum is one that uh, people tend to sort of stumble over. And then here's the pisiform. The pisiform is, has the most variable positioning out of all the carpal bones. It's out sort of the, outside of the uh, intrinsic carpal rows. So that one can have a little bit of a variable uh, location. And then we wrap around, we have the hamate, this little uh, C-shaped structure there is the hook of the hamate. And then you have your capitate. And then we get to the other two T's, and that always screws people up as well, uh, the trapezoid and the trapezium. And the way that I remember them and keep them straight is the trapezium articulates with thumb, your trapezoid sits above scaphoid, and capitate above lunate. All right, so look at the endings, and that'll help you sort of keep those two straight. Moving on into the forearm, obviously you have your radial styloid, your ulnar styloid, your radial head, and your olecranon. You'll notice that the forearm forms a ring. It's a ring structure. It's joined at both ends with uh, your distal radial ulnar joint here and your radial head here. That concept is very important. As we go on, we're going to touch on that. It's a ring structure. It's really hard to break a ring in just one place. Think of trying to snap a lifesaver. It's really hard to do that. And that's going to have implications in terms of patterns of injury that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Moving up into the elbow, Maureen already did a great job of going through this, so we're going to go quickly. There's your radial head. There's your olecranon. There you're articulating condyles, and they should form that nice figure of eight or hourglass appearance that she talked about. Moving up into the shoulder, you have your clavicular head, you have your chromium, together they form the AC joint. There's your coracoid process, that's the crow's beak that's coming out of the film at us. There's your greater tuberosity, there's your glenoid. All right, so how do we read them? Again, ABCs, they work really, really well with orthopedic radiology. Alignment, bones, cartilage or joint spaces, and soft tissues and spacing. Looking at the wrist, in terms of alignment, we talk about three arcs, and those arcs are formed by the carpal bones. And we're talking about the proximal border of the proximal row, the distal border of the proximal row, and the proximal border of the distal row. And you'll see they form just nice, smooth, sweeping arcs. Again, keeping in mind that the piece of form is sort of outside of that. It sort of does its own thing. In terms of bones, again, just like when you put a chest x-ray up, everyone focuses on the lungs. When you put a wrist film up, everyone focuses on the carpal bones. It's just human nature. So you need to train yourself to look at everything that's on the film. And the easiest way to do that is just start at the bottom and work your way up. And you're tracing out every little cortex. The wrist is very much like the foot in that there's a lot of bony overlap and a lot of mock lines. So you really got to take your time and trace out each cortex. In terms of joints, in, we t there are obviously a lot of articulations in the wrist, but one of the most important is the distal radial ulnar joint, which is right here. 
And that's the articulation between the radius and the ulna, and that's part of what joins that forearm into a ring. So you need to pay close attention to that DRUJ. And on the frontal view or the AP view, those two should be at least touching, if not overlapped, in an adult. If there's space in between there, that's a DRUJ disruption, and that's unstable. In terms of spacing, obviously there's tons of little joints in there. All of those joints should be about the same size. That should correct for everyone's own anatomy, but every one of them should be about the same spacing. Looking at the lateral wrist, in terms of alignment, we talk about four C's. And the four C's are formed by the distal radius, which in turn cups the lunate. And by the way, you see the lunate is sort of crescent-shaped, right? That's how it got its name, after a crescent moon. So distal radius, proximal lunate, distal lunate, which in turn cups the capitate. And they should form a nice straight line down. In terms of bones, obviously there's a ton of overlap on a lateral x-ray. It's hard to really see a lot of bony detail for most of the carpal bones. But in particular, we pay very close attention to the triquetrum, which is um, right here, that little nubbin of a bone back there. It's the dorsal most of the carpal bones, and the reason why it's important to look at it is the vast majority of triquetral fractures will only show up on this lateral view. All right, so that's one of the important things that we look at on the lateral is the triquetrum. All the rest of the bones, it's hard to make much of. In terms of the joints, again, we're looking at that DRUJ, that distal radial ulnar joint, and here they're nicely overlapped, which is what we want. With a DRUJ disruption, often, often one of those, and usually it's the ulna, is posteriorly displaced. So then the question always comes up is, when you get a lateral film and you see that they're not lined up right on top of each other, is it that there's a true disruption, or is it just that the film was a little bit oblique, they didn't take a true lateral? And the way that you can look at that is, you look at the ulnar styroid, which is right down here, and that should be pointing right up towards the triquetrum. If it's pointing up off into space, then that's a true DRUJ disruption. If it's still pointing up towards the triquetrum, then it's probably just technique and the film's a little rotated. And we're going to touch on that a little bit more as to why that DRUJ is so important. Moving up into the elbow, um, again in terms of alignment, we need to see that those condyles are overlapping, that it's a nice figure eight. And Marina did a good job of explaining why. If the patient is oblique and they're not lined up, you can miss those fat pads. And they're just as important in adults as they are in kids, um, and we don't want to miss them. So you need to make sure that that film is a true lateral. Um, here's one where you can see, you know, one condyle's down here, the other one's up here. So technically, that is not an adequate film. Having said that, this person has massive anterior and posterior fat pads, so we kind of know that something's going on there. But technically speaking, it's not a truly adequate lateral film. Uh, Maureen also went through the lines. We look at the anterior humeral line, which should intersect the middle third of the capitellum. And we also look at the radio capitellar line, which again should intersect that middle third of the capitellum. And here we're looking, most times you're going to see a, a supracondylar or an intracondylar fracture in adults, but radial head dislocations can be super subtle, and that's where the radio capitellar line comes in. I usually just sit there with the PAX monitor with a piece of paper and just make my line and check it. It takes two seconds, but get yourself in the habit of doing that. Um, again, fat pads, Marine covered pretty well. There's a nice posterior, there's a big anterior sail sign, so those are both pathologic. Just like in kids, adults can also have a normal anterior fat pad. It should be very narrow and hug the bone. Once it splays out into that sail shape, that becomes pathologic. A posterior fat pad, always pathologic. P for posterior, P for pathologic. That's how I remember it. Um, so in terms of the shoulder alignment, one of the things we're looking at is alignment of the clavicle and the acromion. And so the inferior border of the clavicle should line up with the inferior border of the acromion. If they're displaced, that's an AC separation. The other thing that we're looking at in terms of alignment is the humeral head should be overlapping the glenoid. A little bit, they call that the rim sign. If you're seeing clear space in there in an adult, you need to be worried that there's actually a shoulder dislocation there.
Um, and classically, that's going to be a posterior shoulder dislocation, which can be, it's always on like the top 10 orthopedic pitfalls that we miss um, because they can be subtle. With shoulders, again, that saying in radiology, one view is no view. You always need a view in a different plane. And for shoulders, there's a couple of options. This is by far the best option. This is what's known as an axillary Y view because it forms a nice Y shape. And they basically shoot right up through the axilla. And the benefit of this view, there's two. One is that it directly shows the relationship of the humeral head in the glenoid, so you know that the shoulder is located. The other benefit to it is you actually get a look here at the AC joint because most AC separations are going to be vertically displaced. But there's one, it's a type 4 AC separation that actually comes out anteriorly. And if all you're getting is one frontal view of the shoulder, you can miss that because it's in plane with the injury. So you need something that's against in a different plane for you to see that. And the, the axillary Y view gives you that. All right, cases. Uh, this kid comes in. He was playing football, went to grab somebody, and comes in with finger pain. And so here's your AP frontal view of the hand. We look at it quick, we don't really see much. Again, one view is no view. You look at the lateral, and very quickly you can see that there's a problem going on right up here. So it's a tiny little fracture. Is it a big deal? It's in his ring finger. So it doesn't look like it should matter all that much, but in reality, this is actually a flexor tendon injury, and this is what's known as a jersey finger not for the state, but for the type of injury. And what it is, is it's a hyperextension injury with a finger held in fixed flexion, like what happens when somebody goes to grab somebody's jersey. And what happens is you end up avulsing off your flexor digitorum profundus, which is what allows your, your finger to bend at the DIP. It's important to note that you'll still be able to flex at your PIP because you have intact flexor digitorum um, superficialis. It splits and the profundus goes through the middle of that. So when you're examining a hand, you have to isolate out every little joint. It's really easy to miss this when you say, hey, can you move your fingers? And the person does this. You say, yeah, grossly intact. But what you may be missing is that they're not flexing at the DIP. So when you're examining a hand, you have to isolate out every joint. Um, most often, these occur in the ring finger like three-quarters of the time just because it's a weaker attachment point. These need urgent orthopedic follow-up. It's a flexor tendon injury. Those need to be repaired pretty quickly. The longer you wait, the worse the prognosis in terms of recovery. It's also important to note that this one has a bony avulsion with it. Sometimes it's a pure tendon injury. So those ones can be really super subtle because you don't even have plain film findings to go by. So again, physical exam is really important. This kid comes in uh, with finger pain uh, while playing basketball. And when we look at the lateral, it's almost like the exact opposite injury as a jersey finger. And here you see this little avulsion on the extensor side of his DIP. And this is what's known as a mallet finger. And this occurs when there's forced flexion with a finger held in extension. And you see this not uncommonly with um, like basketball ball sports because you're you know, taking a snap and you take it bad and it snaps the tip of your finger back. Um, these are extensor tendon injuries. These, the treatment can be very different. These are often managed uh, successfully non-operatively uh, with splinting, but the key with that is you need to keep them splinted for eight to 12 weeks. If you move it at any time during that period, it resets the clock and increases the chance that they may need operative repair. But, and again, just like with a jersey finger, um, you can sometimes have a pure tendon injury without the bony findings as well. So again, a good hand exam, flexion and extension at every joint. All right, classic Fouche injury. You don't see this much here in uh, Vegas with the snow, but back home uh, where I am in New England, we see this all the time. And this person comes in with pain after a fallen outstretched hand. And not too much on the AP view, but when we look at an oblique view, you notice a subtle lucency coming through the scaphoid. So when you see that, the question is, is that a mock line? Is that just from overlapping bone, or is that truly a fracture? And as we trace it over, it stops right at that edge of the scaphoid. And when we come back, it stops right at that edge, which makes me much more inclined to think that this is truly a scaphoid fracture and not just a mock line. 
So you're going to see these. These are super common. Roughly two-thirds of all carpal fractures are scaphoid fractures. It's the most commonly fractured carpal bone. Up to 10% roughly are going to have some other associated injuries, so you want to do a good exam and make sure you're not missing anything else. And we care a lot about these. These are bad injuries to miss. Plain films may be initially negative, and that's why physical exam is really important. If they have a mechanism and any sort of tenderness in the snuff box or with axial loading, the convention is to treat them as if they have a scaphoid fracture with immobilization. And you would get repeat imaging um, in 12 to 14 days. And at that point, if there's a fracture, there will be some bony resorption along the fracture line and you should be able to see it. The consequence of missing a scaphoid fracture is non-union and avascular necrosis because the blood supply to the proximal part of the scaphoid is very tenuous. And if it's disrupted, that piece ends up dying and it causes vastly accelerated osteoarthritis and a lot of chronic pain. And sort of the end treatment when they fail everything else is a proximal carpectomy where they go in and they carve out that entire proximal carpal row. So you can imagine what effect that's gonna have on somebody's um, mobility. And so these are high, high risk injuries and a, a big source of litigation for us when we miss them. So negative radiographs don't rule it out. If they're tender in the snuff box, you splint them and get them prompt follow-up. This is what it looks like in somebody who's had it missed. So here's this proximal piece that's all sclerotic and shrunken, and you see all this bad osteophyte formation. This is a really you know, debilitated wrist. And a lot of these happen in young people, so they have a whole lifetime ahead of them. And so you really have to have a high index of suspicion for these. Here's another foosh, again, coming in with wrist pain. And when we look at our alignment and our spacing, something seems a little off. And in particular, when we look here at the articulation between the lunate and the scaphoid, it's much wider than these other intercarpal um, distances. It's like twice or three times the size. And so this is known as a scapholunate dissociation. Classically occurs with a Fouche-type mechanism, and it's a disruption of the scapholunate ligament. And they call it the Terry Thomas sign or the Dave Letterman sign um, for the gap in their teeth, because that's what it looks like. Um, this is, an, this is an unstable injury and often requires operative fixation. Oftentimes they're going to have some other type of injury as well, so you want to carefully look through uh, the x-rays and make sure you're not missing anything else. When, so carpal injuries are sort of a spectrum, and when you apply more force or more energy, you start with a scapholunate dissociation or a fracture, but then you start to disrupt the other attachments of the scaphoid with the other carpal bones. And when that happens, the scaphoid can tip because it becomes grossly unstable. And when it tips, it tends to tip volarly. And so instead of looking at it in the short axis where it looks like a coffee bean, it starts to give a rounded appearance um, like that. And that's known as rotary subluxation. And they call that the signet ring sign because it looks like a, a ring sideways, um, sort of like that. Again, grossly unstable, needs operative repair. Um, just for reference, what a normal scaphoid looks like, it has that nice coffee bean appearance. Now it's on the left, it's tipped, all right, it's subluxed. Another foosh. And again, coming in with wrist pain, your AP films look pretty good, nothing obvious, but when we look at the lateral, we see this little fleck right there. That's what a classic triquetral fracture looks like. It's a tiny little chip fracture. Again, most commonly from a foosh type injury. It's the second most commonly fractured carpal bone, so you're gonna see a lot of these. And the vast majority, 90 to 95%, are these little dorsal chip fractures. And I think what happens is when you hyperextend it that your ulnar styloid bangs that little piece off. The other five to 10% are body fractures, and those tend to be higher energy mechanisms and often have other associated injuries with it. Now, if you miss this little chip fracture, it's not the end of the world, all right? We splint them mostly for comfort. As long as they don't have any other injuries, it's not that big a deal. It's more of a nuisance fracture. Um, but it's poor form to miss anything, right? And so look on your lateral for those triquetral fractures. Um, body fractures, on the other hand, tend, like I said, tend to be higher energy mechanism. And they can be subtle. So just like in foot, when we get different views, we look for different things. In the hand, we also get different views. We get an AP, an oblique, and a lateral, just like in the foot. And one of the big reasons why we get 
and oblique is to get a better look at the triquetral body. Same patient, and here the pisiform is sitting right on top of it so it can hide the triquetral body. Here we get an oblique, and we see that nice fracture going right through. All right, so that's why we get different views. We're looking for different things. This girl comes in, she was an MBA, she's learning how to drive, um, and comes in complaining of hand and wrist pain, and we get this film. And you can see she's still fusing her physis a little bit. Um, they're not completely fused. And it's an oblique film. And I love this film. I put it up for the residents all the time. And despite 10 minutes prior saying to make sure you look at everything, everyone focuses on the carpal bones and they're like, I don't see anything. And yet, if you're systematic and you go all the way up, you see sitting up here this little guy. That's a sesamoid bone. That's normal. That is not. All right, that's a fracture at the base of the thumb. So, in terms of seriousness, it's a tiny little fracture, does it really matter? Actually does, all right? This is what's known as a gamekeeper's or a skier's thumb. And what this is, basically, is an injury to the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb. Uh, you can have a pure ligamentous injury where you don't have the bony fracture, and those can be really subtle, but in this case, we have the fracture to guide us. And the problem with this injury is, that's what allows us a pincher grasp, right? And in theory, this is what separates us from the animals. So if we don't have that, it doesn't leave us with much, right? And delay in treatment worsens prognosis. So if you see this, you need to get them very prompt orthopedic follow-up. Again, you can have a pure ligamentous injury. And in those cases, it really comes down to physical exam. So if they're tender right down at the base of the thumb on the ulnar side, put them in a splint, and you're gonna splint them not in a typical thumb spica, but in, in a more neutral position where you're offloading that ligament, and you're gonna get them prompt orthopedic follow-up, and they can take it from there. Again, more classically, it's called a gamekeeper's thumb. That's more of a chronic overuse type injury. In the acute setting, we call it more of a skier's thumb, which implies more of an acute pathology. It's interesting, I always used to think it was from the, the poles hitting the thumbs, but they've actually studied it and debunked that. And even though it's common in skiers, I think it's just from the high energy falling and hitting the ground. The poles actually have nothing to do with it. Um, but you see it in MVAs not infrequently from the steering wheel. All right? They lock their hands on the steering wheel, and it either snaps it back or the airbag going off sometimes takes the thumb. Okay. This guy comes in. Talk about a rough day. Um, and he has this. So not all that subtle, right? So he has a distal radius fracture. But again, remember I said we have to pay careful attention to the DRUJ. The forearm is a ring, and it's really hard to break it in just one place. And when we look here, they're totally separated. So not only is this a distal radius fracture, but it's an ulnar dislocation as well, which makes it a Galeazzi fracture dislocation. Now, I am not a big fan of eponyms, but this shows up on almost every single licensing exam I've ever taken. They really love these. And the reason why is because you need to think about that other injury in the forearm. The fractures are usually pretty obvious, but that other injury, whether it's a DRUJ disruption or a radial head dislocation, they can be very subtle. And so the, they drill these eponyms to force you guys to look for those other injuries. So a galeazzi is a fracture of the mid to distal radius with a dislocation of the ulna or a DRUJ disruption. Here's an MBA. Um, obvious proximal ulnar fracture. I would say looking at the films that there's probably a high chance that that's an open fracture because somebody put some curlex on top of it. And when we look here, there's a pretty obvious radial head dislocation. Now that makes this a montasia fracture dislocation. So it's a fracture of the proximal ulna and a radial head dislocation. These are very obvious examples. They often are not that obvious. So again, look for that other injury. Look at your line, um, your radio capitellar line, look at your anterior humeral line. So how do you remember them? Radiology uses the mugger mnemonic. So montasia is an ulnar fracture, a galeazzi is a radial fracture. You just have to remember what the associated injury is. This guy comes in electrocuted, complaining of shoulder pain. So we get an AP shoulder. And as we're looking at our alignment, remember I said the humeral head is normally eccentric and it should overlap the glenoid. And in this case, we're seeing clear space in between the two. All right. So that concerns me. So you need to get a different 
a, a lateral equivalent, if you will, in the shoulder. And this patient was having so much pain that they couldn't get an axillary Y view. So instead what they got was this, and this is what's known as a scapular Y view, which is where they don't have to manipulate the arm at all, and they basically shoot down the blade of the scapula. And what we're looking at here is your glenoid sits right here in the middle of the Y. All right, and your humeral head should be sitting up here, centered over that Y, and instead it's posteriorly displaced. So this is a posterior shoulder dislocation. Again, if you're only getting one view in the shoulder, these can be super subtle, and any orthopedic pitfall lecture that you go to is gonna have this on it. Just for reference, the one on the left is a normal humerus, the one on the right is dislocated, and instead of being eccentric, it becomes much more symmetrically rotated, and they call that the light bulb on a stick. All right, very abnormal. Okay, so we sped through that. Take on points. Wrist films are difficult. Um, you need to take your time with them. Just like with feet, they're very difficult films because of all the bony overlap. Missing injuries there has a, high, uh, has a lot of consequences and a high risk for uh, litigation. Remember your ABCs, all right, all the time. Alignment, bones, cartilage, joint spacing. Remember that negative x-rays do not rule out a scaphoid fracture. There's actually some interesting literature out there um, looking at MRI in the acute setting to diagnose uh, scaphoid fractures. And even though they're expensive, there's some data out there and an argument to be made that getting an early MRI may in the end be more cost effective than splinting somebody, putting them out of work, and having repeat visits for repeat films. So it'll be interesting as we you know, pay more attention to resource utilization, how that sort of plays out in the upcoming years. Um, remember that the forearm is a ring, all right? If you see a break in one place, you gotta look for a break in the other place. Um, and that posterior shoulder dislocations can be super subtle, so you always need two views of the shoulder. All right.